Good morning. Good morning. I am pleased to introduce to you Dr. Lerone Martin, who is Associate Professor in Religion and Politics at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. But actually, um, Dr. Martin is one of ours. Uh, he earned his BA from Anderson University and his MDiv from Princeton, and his PhD from Emory. Um, but from 2010 to 2013, he was here at Eden as Assistant Professor of American Religious History and Culture. So, and then from here, he went to a bigger but not necessarily better place, <laughs> which is Wash U. However, Wash U did give him the uh, space to write a book. Relig uh, and he would have written that here too if he had stayed. <laughs> uh, uh, the book is called Preaching on Wax, the Phonograph and the Making of Modern African American Religion, which New York University published. And this book tracks the role of the phonograph in the shaping of African-American religion, culture, and politics during the first half of the 20th century. The book won several prizes, including the um, 2015 Frank S. and Elizabeth D. Brewer Prize for Outstanding Scholarship in Religious History by a first-time author from the American Society of Church History. He has also received a number of national, nationally recognized fellowships, including the National Endowment for Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, and the Louisville Institute for the Study of American Religion. Dr. Martin has also been recognized for his teaching, receiving grants and fellowships from the Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning in Theology and Religion. And in 2019, the students in the College of Arts and Sciences at WashU awarded him the Art Sci Excellence in Teaching Award in Humanities. Um, the subject of his lecture, he's writing a book um, on the, uh, the relationship between religion, the FBI, and national security in American history. And that's forthcoming from Princeton University Press. We welcome Dr. Martin. So, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, you know, there's a saying that you can never go home again because when you leave, home changes and you change. But um, one thing that hasn't changed uh, is that the faithfulness and the testimony to Christ that is here at Eden. And I must confess that with reading the headlines and just existing day to day and breathing day to day. Um, this is a place that continually gives me hope about faith communities, Protestant faith communities in particular, about what the witness of faithful, committed, informed, knowledgeable clergy can do for faith communities. So I want to thank you for having me back. and. Uh, what I want to do uh, today is talk a little bit about um, the FBI. <laughs> and um, what brought me interest in this topic was a couple of things. First, um, my interest in religious broadcasting. I've always been interested in the history of religious broadcasting in this country. So that was my scholarly interest. My existential interest, if you will, was um, the tragedy of the death of Michael Brown. And as I was talking with uh, members of the St. Louis faith community, I discovered that a number of them had been contacted by the FBI about um, various aspects going on in the St. Louis community. 
including um, before the decision was announced to not pursue criminal charges against uh, Officer Darren Wilson, um, there was a conference call of the FBI to a number of uh, local clergy about um, getting assistance and helping to keep the St. Louis community calm. And so uh, these two things converged for me and uh, had me thinking, how long has the FBI been involved and interested in America's faith communities? And exactly what does that involvement look like? What does that involvement entail? And how is it shaped faith communities, but also the FBI itself? So the FBI remains obviously a topic of our discussions, admiration, and fascination. Politically speaking, you can barely turn on the news without hearing something about the FBI, whether it was the Mueller investigation, FBI Director James Comey, et cetera, et cetera. Culturally speaking, the FBI is still very relevant. As most of you know, the three leading networks on television today all have shows about the FBI. CBS's show is simply called The FBI. Uh, ABC has a show called Quantico, which is a popular show with some of my students. And NBC has a show called The Blind Spot, which is also about an FBI agent. But for faith communities and religious professionals, the FBI is more than just a fascination or a matter of electoral politics. Um, if faith communities and those that lead them seek to empower the oppressed, care for the least of these, and advocate for social justice, we should expect to encounter duly constituted authorities, namely local and federal law enforcement. As history and life has shown us, these guardians of law and order are often also the most overzealous protectors of the political, racial, gendered, and sexual status quo. There is always the possibility that in the course of their duties, this pursuit of justice, that federal law enforcement can intentionally or accidentally crush and discourage dissent. The quest for lawbreakers, real or imagined by the FBI and other forms of law enforcement, can be conducted in a way that does severe injury to constitutional rights, values, and the witness of Christ. The FBI has a history of pursuing and viewing people whose opinions or lifestyle challenge the established quo. They consider those folks to be criminal and perhaps worthy of harassment and intimidation at worst or at least silenced. However, we all know that such groups who have raised dissent in American history have often made our society better. Abolitionists, advocates for women's suffrage and women's rights, civil rights advocates, LGBTQ rights, etc. They have all engaged in various forms of dissent to make America a better place. So in order to formulate a theologically informed response to these realities, I think it's important that we must be informed not just by our own theological traditions, but also of the religious traditions of the FBI and its engagement of faith communities. So what I want to do today is examine the religious history of the FBI and how the churches have responded to the FBI. I believe this history, as all church history, is a vital tool for theological reflection. So this morning, I will argue for the overlooked and forgotten way that a particular brand of religion um, has influenced and shaped our FBI. And then in the afternoon, I want to examine a few case studies of how Protestants and Catholics have responded to the FBI, all, in the, all with the hope um, um, in the end to bring us to a conclusion of what should we do if the FBI comes knocking on our door. J. Edgar Hoover. Um, as most of you know, the FBI is profoundly shaped by J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover took over the FBI in 1924, and he remained as head of the FBI until his death in 1972. So he's one of the longest serving civil servants in American history. And Hoover is responsible for shaping uh, the modern FBI in a myriad of ways. It's under Hoover's watch that um, people of color and women who are serving the FBI are dismissed. It's under Hoover's watch that FBI agents carry uh, weapons. And also uh, the modern classification 
of uh, FBI files. The FBI has kept a tremendous library of files that's all been classified in various different ways. And also the FBI building still in Washington, D.C., as many of you know, is named the J. Edgar Hoover Building. So Hoover is uh, primarily responsible for the shaping of the modern FBI, and uh, Hoover himself had a deep uh, commitment to faith. So this is a picture of Hoover and his family. He was born January 1st, 1895, and he was started off uh, as a young man in the Lutheran church, and then he later uh, was baptized into the Presbyterian church in Washington, D.C., where he lived his entire life. Um, I visited his personal estate and I uh, looked at copies of his youthful teenage diary, um, which are full of, of his um, reflections upon his faith. Here's a couple of things. Baptized at five o'clock, and his brother's name is Dick. Baptized at five o'clock in Dick's house by Reverend Wildly, or Wildly, I believe that is. Um, he was elected Sunday school um, secretary, elected secretary of a Sunday school class as a young man. And of course, as all teenagers, he always had room for jokes in his diary. April 1st, April Fool's Day fooled a lot of people. <laughs> but for Hoover, Sunday school was the, one of the most important things. And in fact, uh, as a young man pictured here, uh, he often showed up for Sunday school in his cadet uniform. And for Hoover, what's important here is the way that religion and state for Hoover are to come together. And his wearing of his cadet uniform as a, as a Sunday school instructor shows that the way that Hoover really, really completely understands religion and faith to be, one, excuse me, to be faith and nation to be one, that they're one and the same. He's a religious nationalist. Sunday school remains important for Hoover throughout his entire life. Here is an article in a local newspaper uh, about what Sunday school has done for him. And there at the bottom there, I know it may be hard to read, but he, he says that Sunday school has given him a faith and has given him a position of no compromise with folks who do not abide by the Christian life. So Hoover is very, very, very committed to the Sunday school and what the Sunday school means. And throughout his career and throughout his time as FBI director, he sees this idea of Sunday school as being a cure-all for all that, that, all that uh, ails the nation. Here's another example of his religious nationalism. He, has an, he wrote an article for Lookout magazine called A Good Christian is a Good Citizen. And where he goes back and forth and lays out his religious nationalism. And I'll, I'll put those up here in a second too, so you can get an idea of Hoover's I of ideas of what Hoover understands the role of faith in society. First, for Hoover, the soul is the primary unit of global society. So for Hoover, when he's thinking about government action and thinking about the role of the FBI, he's always thinking about souls. He's always thinking about the existential idea, if you will, or the eternal, the eternal nature of human souls. For Hoover, he argued, and this is a quote from the article, the, ele the essential elements of democracy are very vividly summed up for us in the Ten Commandments. So Hoover saw in the Ten Commandments the very foundation of American democracy. And he also argued that the United States is fundamentally a Christian nation. So for Hoover, America was a Christian nation, and he saw his job in many ways as maintaining America as a Christian nation. Now, of course, as we'll get a chance to see, for Hoover, that's a particular kind of Christian, and that Christian looks a particular kind of way. Hoover also believed that without morality, without religion, there could be no morality. Um, and for, for that, we've seen that a lot within our politics today. It's a particular kind of religion, of course, that they believe has uh, e equates to a kind of morality. Uh, next, of course, is his idea of Christian citizen, Christianity and citizenship. That for Hoover, for one to be a U.S. citizen, one needs to be a Christian. And if one is a Christian, one can be a U.S. citizen. Now, of course, for Hoover, again, that looks a particular kind of way. We'll get into that. He always believed that governmental authority was inherently good. So no matter what the government decided to do, as long as it was led by Christian men, it was always good. 
that grow Christian support and preserve government. That was another idea of his. So anybody who was in the streets proclaiming anything contrary to governmental authority, Hoover would believe they were not Christian. He also believed that the teachings of God prevent criminality. There was no social uh, or systemic or structural analysis. If anyone committed crime in Hoover's eyes, they were not Christian. And for Hoover, the progress of democracy was always wrapped up in the advancement of Christianity. So as Christianity advanced in America, he saw democracy advancing as well. Now, for those of you in preaching class with Professor Grundy, you'll know, perhaps know this term here. Hoover proclaimed all this in what's called a Jeremiad. All of Hoover's speeches and sermons, he's one of the most, not sermons, speeches, he's one of the most prolific publishers in American history because he has a team of ghostwriters writing lots of essays for him. And for Hoover, it's always that the past, America's past, is the model. We got to get back to the past in order for, to make America great again, no pun intended. So for Hoover, it's always wrapped up in the past. Now the Jeremiah, the traditional Jeremiah, many of you know, identifies a problem that shows a decline in American history. So Hoover would always find a problem. He would say, crime is on the rise. Crime in the past was not that bad. Today it's really bad. He would identify a turning point. What exactly has caused this decline? Whether it's no longer having prayer in schools or it's when certain people can marry other people. It's always there's a turning point and there's divine punishment for this. And then of course, America can avoid that if America repents or, re or has a revival and has reform. All of this is the way that Hoover delivers much of his address, uh, his, many of his addresses about faith and politics. And I think one quote sums up uh, best about what Hoover really, really believed about the role of faith in America. And he had said this in 1942. I am sure that if more emphasis were placed on the gospel of salvation and less on social justice, the latter would become a great reality. So you see the, the kind of idea that Hoover has about faith and social justice and that the idea that the best way to make America whole again is by saving individual souls. And then of course America will then have greater social justice. Now my argument here is that all of this helps to shape the way Hoover and his men here really, really understand themselves and the role and the mission of the FBI in protecting this kind of world. And first and foremost, Hoover decides, as you can see from this picture, as I mentioned earlier, that the only special agents can be white and male and can be publicly heterosexual. And I say that publicly purposely. He also decides that the men need to be married, although he himself was a lifelong bachelor. And he had, as you see here next to him at the, at the front, it's Hoover on the far end there, and, and nearest to me is Clyde Tolson, who was the associate director of the FBI. Hoover and Clyde, for all intents and purposes, were domestic partners. Um, they didn't live together, but they had lunch and dinner together every day. They vacationed together every day in his personal estate, their field of photos of them together at the beach, hanging out, shirts off, I'll spare you, don't worry. <laughs> um, but, but there's no evidence, and I wanna be clear about this, there's no evidence that there was a sexual relationship, but it's clearly they functioned as domestic partners. Um, and even when J. Edgar Hoover died, he willed a great deal of his estate to Clyde Tolson, and at his funeral, when they removed the flag from Hoover's casket and folded it up, they gave it to Clyde Tolson as if they would to someone's spouse. Now I think this is important just because of thinking about the way that Hoover pursues and uses homosexuality uh, throughout his uh, reign of the FBI as a way to um, um, undermine people and discredit people, even as he himself in many ways had a same-sex relationship. What Hoover does, though, however, is he issues a FBI pledge for law enforcement officers. And it's really long, and here's just one part I've pulled out for you that I think is important for our purposes. 
He draws up a pledge for FBI law enforcement officers and tells them that they have to sign this pledge. And he sends it out to, to police, uh, police uh, stations and departments across the country. Part of this pledge says, I shall, as a minister, seek to supply comfort, advice, and aid to those who may be in need of such benefits. As a soldier, I so wage vigorous warfare against the enemies of my country, of its laws, and of its principles. So this is one way that Hoover is using his faith to help FBI agents to think about their task in the world as ministers and as soldiers. All right, now those are two images I want to focus on for the remainder of our time. The first I'll start with is the soldier. Hoover really, 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 in an ecumenical way, loved the Jesuits. As many of you know from the church history courses that St. Ignatius uh, of Loyola was, uh, was the founder of the Jesuits. He was a soldier who was wounded in war and dedicated his life to Christ to be a soldier for God. And Hoover was very attracted to this idea of this soldiering idea for God. And he uh, loved uh, that about the Jesuits. And he became very close to the Jesuits. At a speech he gave at a Jesuit gathering, he said, quote, I am a Protestant. And as a Protestant, I sincerely, sincerely and from experience know that the Catholic Church is the greatest protective influence in our nation today. I, as a Protestant, pay tribute to your Catholic educational institutions in which love of God and love of country are taught and practiced. I wish that more of your universities and colleges were teaching love of God and country. So Hoover befriends a Catholic priest by the name of Reverend Lloyd, who's a Jesuit, who runs a, a Catholic retreat center outside of DC. And what Hoover institutes for his FBI agents are actually Jesuit spiritual retreats for FBI agents to go on. Here's a flyer that went around FBI um, headquarters. And as you can see here, this is redacted from an FBI file. But as you can see, it announces the FBI annual Manresa retreat. The retreat was at Manresa, which was named after the place where St. Ignatius Loyola uh, hid in a cave and was committed himself to God. And as you can see here, every division in the FBI there has a captain for this retreat. So you can see there the identification division, which is blacked out, the inspection, administrative, domestic intelligence, which is what most of us associate the FBI with. This is the spying and the surveillance. All of these individuals, all of these divisions had a retreat captain, and all of them were in charge of getting FBI agents together to go on a spiritual retreat. Here's a photo of FBI agents gathered there at the spiritual retreat. You see the name Manresa on the door behind them. And they all gathered and went at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, on a spiritual retreat. Now, spir Jesuit spiritual practices, as you know, um, involve uh, a number of steps. And St. Ignatius called them the spiritual exercises. This is a photo of the outside of the spiritual retreat where FBI agents went to. You see there are lots of Catholic um, uh, statues and saints listed there. And FBI agents went there and performed spiritual exercises. Here's a shot of, of course, from the back of their, back of their head. They don't want some of them to be too closely identified about what happens at the spiritual retreat. So I just want to go through briefly what actually the spiritual exercises are um, at, at the spiritual retreat. Um, the first uh, is focusing on sin and overcoming sin and self. Um, the idea um, is that um, an individual can be dedicated to God, a soldier for God, if they are over, able to overcome oneself and over to able come, overcome sin. At FBI retreats, this is primarily talked about in the form of communism and materialism. Secondly, FBI agents are, were led in the sanctuary um, to think, to ponder on the life of Jesus Christ and God's kingdom and the incarnation. And they were to ponder to think about three questions at these retreats. 
First, what have I done for Christ the King in the past? Next, what am I doing for Christ now? And finally, what do I intend to do for Christ in the future? So there's a way that Hoover is using these retreats to help FBI agents to think about their task as soldiers of Christ and as working on behalf of God. Third, special agents focused on the life and the passion of Christ during the third week of the, re during the retreat. This was thought of as to uh, help agents think about how are they participating in the suffering of Christ. And in interesting sorts of ways, this is also thought about suffering in terms of on a stakeout, if you're sur surveilling someone, if you are going through someone's mail or participating in ideas that may not be lawful, this was construed as suffering with Christ. And finally, uh, FBI agents were challenged to think about the joy and the victory of Christ's resurrection and the ascension. So this, these were the retreats the FBI went on. They began in the early 40s and continued even after Hoover's death. Um, one of the most popular folks to attend and speak at the retreat, they invited various different Catholic priests to come to the retreat, um, was Father uh, Fulton Sheen. Some of you may know that name. Fulton Sheen is considered the first Catholic televangelist. He had his own TV show for a number of years. And Fulton Sheen was a two-time Emmy Award-winning televangelist, in fact. And he spoke at the FBI retreat. And all of these, all of these talks and lectures that individuals like uh, Fulton Sheen gave were all predicated upon the idea that the FBI was doing its job as leading America and restraining evil and helping America maintain its Christian foundations. Here is just a summary report um, of uh, how FBI agents write back to Hoover and let Hoover know what happens at the retreat there. This is just an example though. The, these, this is a memo that's found in FBI file. It goes through and tells you exactly everything that happened at the retreat and they're reporting back to Mr. Hoover and Mr. Tolson about everything that's gone on, what sermon was preached, how the sermon was preached, how FBI agents responded, how it lifted up the work of the FBI, how the FBI was, was held as um, the arbiter or as the hand of God interacting in, um, interacting in America. So all of this happens year after year after year after year. Agents go on retreats. There is a superior who examines them, checks on them, and then writes back to Hoover's office to letting Hoover know everything that went on and everything that happened at the retreat. And again, it's a way to ritualize FBI labor, if you will, and a way to ritualize all that the FBI has done and is doing and plans to do, all with the idea that it's doing for Christ. The second aspect of uh, the soldier uh, idea, but also then turning now to the minister idea, is in addition to these FBI spiritual retreats, the FBI also holds an annual mass and communion breakfast. Here's another flyer uh, that's in FBI files. Um, every year the FBI would host a mass and communion breakfast for FBI employees, their relatives and friends. And at this event there would be a mass held, um, communion breakfast held afterwards. And at these events there were unusually um, a minister, a priest, would preach a sermon lionizing the FBI. The FBI would have reserved seating in the center of the sanctuary. The priest would lionize the FBI as working for and with God. And also, afterwards, the communion breakfast, they would have a famous speaker come and speak to them. Uh, and that was a number of people. Mostly, it was always men when FBI agents uh, asked Hoover for permission to invite a woman, a woman by the name of Irene Dunn, who was well-known uh, film actress from the 30s and 40s. Hoover rejected that. He only wanted men speaking to his men. And there were always white men at that. There were senators, congressmen, civil servants, and even uh, professional athletes. The uh, well-known football coach Vincent Lombardi also was one of their featured speakers. Um, they, believe it or not, the FBI invited Ed McMahon 
several times, the famous from The Tonight Show, but Ed McMahon kept telling them, I'm busy. <laughs> so Ed McMahon had some sense there, I guess. Well, I'll argue that from my perspective, he had some sense. So at these events, in addition to having a priest and a guest speaker, Hoover always, he would never went. That's what's interesting about these. He ordered these events like a bishop, but he never, ever, ever went. He never attended them. But he always, and I'll use this phrase purposely, sent his word, if you will. So he always sent his word. Here's one example. So this is a statement from Hoover that is to be read at the event, although he never attended. He would say, it is a pleasure to extend, uh, excuse me, pleasure to extend best wishes, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to move over so I can read it. It is a pleasure to extend best wishes on the occasion of the 15th annual FBI Mass and Communion Breakfast. And this day, when a large number of our citizens are completely engrossed in the material things of life, it is a source of deep pride to know that so many men and women of the FBI, their family and friends, gather each year in this now traditional manifestation of their faith in God. Belief in God and his teachings is vital in the fight we daily wage against the insidious forces seeking to engulf us. Without this belief, crime would soon be rampant. Without, without it, communistic atheism would rob us of our spiritual existence. Let us mold our lives in his image and likeness and strive to uphold the Christian ideals upon which this great nation was founded. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI. So these messages were always read aloud at these events. Hoover again never went, but he made sure his people were there and his executives were there. So again, you see the idea of FBI agents having this culture within the Bureau of thinking their, that what they're doing is working for God and on behalf of God. The Protestants, of course, would not be left out. The Protestants had their own FBI Vesper and worship service as well within the FBI. This traveled throughout DC and throughout the uh, churches in DC, um, throughout all denominations. Um, this was a flyer for the Capitol Hill Methodist Church where an FBI worship service was held. Um, and you see there the flyer that's sent around uh, FBI to FBI agents and posted around um, FBI um, headquarters as well. And, and during my research, what I've, what I've tried to do, um, perhaps against my own better judgment, is to uh, track down retired FBI agents and interview them, perhaps against my own better judgment. And uh, a number of them, I've tracked down a number of the first crop of African-American FBI agents, and they joined as special agents doing police work in 1962. There were, there were men, African-American men in the FBI, but they were, they were only drivers or um, worked in firearms or they did work around the office, but Hoover did not have any African-American special agents doing police work. He always said he could never find any that were qualified. In 1962, after getting pressure from Bobby Kennedy, Hoover finally uh, deputizes a couple African-American agents. Um, and just to, just to let you know how extreme it was, um, Bobby Kennedy uh, wrote him a, a, a memo when he, Bobby Kennedy was attorney general and said, how many African-American FBI agents do you have? And Hoover said, I don't know. We don't keep track of that stuff. So then Bobby Kennedy said, well, you need to. I want to know how many African-American FBI agents you have. So Hoover quickly deputizes his driver and gives him a badge and says, like, congratulations, you're now an FBI agent. And he writes back to Bobby Kennedy and says, you know, I've got, I've got two. And he deputizes someone else. I've got two. And uh, Bobby Kennedy said that wasn't enough. So Hoover went on and began to deputize and find FBI agents. I've interviewed a couple of these individuals and they're, uh, who were, were still uh, living, and a number of them told me when I showed them these things um, that they were n never heard of this stuff. They never heard of these worship services. They never heard of these retreats. And um, one of them told me, he said, you know, that's not true. We didn't do that. And I was very happy to show an FBI agent I knew something he didn't know. <laughs> and so um, I showed him this flyer and I said, you know, ta-da, you know, and, and uh, he said, I need to get back to you. And he contacted uh, some of his other colleagues. Um, and he, he wrote back to me in an email and said, yes, this, this did happen. But we were never invited to these worship services. 
I finally interviewed an African-American FBI agent who was Catholic. And uh, he told me that he knew about these um, uh, worship services, although he was never invited. And that he said he would purposely go, and I'm quoting here, forgive me for being in the chapel, just to piss those blankety blank blank guys off, is what he would say. So he purposely went as almost as a gadfly to some of these worship services. So these worship services were inherently not just about an idea of what the FBI was in terms of spiritually, but also socially and racially. And it's almost a ritual, if you will, uh, in segregation and white supremacy. This is just an example of how far some of these worship services went. This is the worship bulletin for the National Presbyterian Church in DC for their worship service. As you can see there, they have actually the emblem of the FBI on the worship bulletin. Um, a quote from Hoover there, and it says the Federal Bureau of Investigation Vesper Service. So just to give you an example of how far some of these worship services went that actually the FBI has its emblem on the actual worship bulletin. And FBI agents participated in the service, never giving the sermon as far as I can tell, but always doing the scripture lesson, always having, uh, um, they even had, believe it or not, an FBI choir who would sing at some of these worship services as well. And so from what I've been able to tell from FBI agents is that these services, because um, the FBI did not officially have a chaplain, these worship services were never, ever, ever um, completely um, required, in terms of officially required. But the culture of the FBI was such that individuals did feel compelled to attend. For example, if your direct report, your boss in a corporate structure, goes to this worship service right, and doesn't see you there, that might have a detrimental impact upon your career in the Bureau. This is what some of the agents I've interviewed have told me. Um, so that's the, the worship services there. Um, this is um, religion news service, would also report on these worship services. Um, as you can see, religion news services will simply put out a press release. More than 1,000 employees of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and their families attended the special Vesper service for FBI workers at National Presbyterian Church. The service, the first of, of its kind ever held for Protestant employees of the Bureau, was sponsored by a group of clerical workers. Director Jacob Hoover arranged for the service to be held at the church of which he is an elder for many years, et cetera, et cetera. I've gone to uh, the National Presbyterian Church, and um, thankfully they were kind enough to let me go through their papers. And uh, Hoover was indeed a member and an elder at the church, and he sat on a number of the church's committees at the National Presbyterian Church, uh, including the church uh, carpet committee and the church sanctuary committee, the grounds committee, et cetera, et cetera. And he also, uh, the church was still collecting pew rents and Hoover always paid his pew rent as well. So this is just uh, a sampling of what um, the FBI uh, worship culture, and if you will, worships uh, idea, um, the ideas they put forth, the ideas that they held, and the ideals that agents um, had about their own experience. So I'll, I'll close here with a couple, just a couple um, uh, uh, ideas and then we can have a, a time of Q&A. Um, what I think all of this shows, at least historically, and then again in the, in the afternoon we'll talk a little bit more about current times, but historically at least what we have here um, is an FBI um, that as uh, the religious culture shaped the kind of employees attracted to and hired by the FBI. As I mentioned, um, Hoover was very strict about the kind of people he would hire. And we also have to think about if knowing that this is the culture of the FBI, what kind of individuals will be attracted to work in the FBI? I think that's important for us to think about. And even today, uh, the FBI still remains not very diverse despite the fact that we have a very diverse country. The statistics from 2016 show that the FBI is 83% 83, 83 white and 80% male despite the fact of the changing demographics of our country. So we have a federal law enforcement that is overseeing, that is largely white and male overseeing 
a very diverse population. And I do not have the religious affiliation of FBI agents today, but again, against my um, better judgment, uh, I wrote a, a letter to the St. Louis FBI and asked if they had a community liaison um, and if that liaison would be interested in coming to one of my classes. And um, I sent a, a fax, a snail mail, and an email. And uh, four months later, I got a response. <laughs> and I thought, you idiot, they just did a background check on you. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, so they contacted me, and they said they had an FBI agent who had transitioned out of the field. And uh, he, uh, he was now doing community liaison work, and he would be happy to come and speak to my class, the class I teach. It's called uh, the FBI and American Religion and Politics. He came to speak, and um, he, he looks like a guy you know you'd see on Law and Order. I mean, he's just you know five o'clock shadow. His tie was hanging on for dear life, you know, and nice guy, you know. Um, and he came and spoke to my class. He has a prepackaged um, lecture that he has that approved by FBI headquarters about all their work in the St. Louis area as it relates to domestic uh, intelligence and, and terrorism. And he was white and male and Christian. His daughter went to Taylor University. He, okay. <laughs> Shout out to Taylor. Uh, <laughs> um, and he was very much so a, a, a good human being, but was very much so wrapped up in an idea of America as a Christian country. Now granted, that's just an anecdote, but that's just a sample of the, of the individual that was sent to my class to speak to my students. Um, another aspect I would say about the religious culture of the FBI um, is that it shapes how the FBI viewed itself, its mission, and its relationship to the nation. And I think that what Hoover was able to do because of the concerns of terrorism and and concerns about communism, especially during, as um, Dr. Greenhall mentioned, during World War II, the FBI is put in the position of really being an adjudicator of true faith, right? The FBI is sent to investigate various groups of people, and they end up being the very adjudicators or judges of what is real faith, right? So they end up having to do surveillance on certain organizations, faith communities, to see if those activities are in line with Christianity or in line with communism. So it ends up putting the FBI in this position of this religious and nationalist organization, putting it in a position as being the adjudicator of what is real faith, and also um, uh, getting to the point where faith communities are, have to be concerned about their activities and their Christian witness, being concerned about having surveillance by the FBI.